from a distance learning group uh, has the has this become the norm now? So what is the difference between online education and distance education? Uh, John, any thoughts you want to share with us on that? Over to you. Thank you. Can you see my slides, Joseph? Yeah, all fine. All right. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I'm not going to talk about uh, what we teach, but I'm going to talk about uh, how we teach and, and how this might change uh, post-COVID. So I, I'm going to use a con conference as an analogy first, and, and then I'm going to say something about teaching before and after COVID, uh, briefly talk about four modalities, say something about what we do at USC and, and, and what we imagine a hybrid future might look like. Uh, so I'm going to use the ESRI User Conference as an example. In 2019, uh, the ESRI User Conference uh, attracted about 18,000 participants, I think, spread over seven or eight days, uh, organized around the San Diego Convention Center. And the ESRI User Conference in 2020 was virtual. It uh, attracted uh, apparently 80,000 participants at the, at the plenary sessions that were, instead of being concentrated in one day, now spread over three days. And most sessions were accompanied by Q&A sessions uh, with the presenters, uh, as you would in an in-person event, but also with, among other things, copies of the slides they used and some other materials they wanted to share. And, uh, you know, I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but I think uh, ESRI and professional societies and others that organize and hold conferences are, are probably thinking about a hybrid future, uh, an in-person event with sessions that are streamed live as well, because on the one hand, the, the value proposition for an in-person meeting is strong, uh, but, but through COVID, we've learned that there's uh, it's not a binary. People either choose to attend or not. There's a large swath of people that would participate, but they just don't want to be or can't be in the site where you hold the event. And, you know, to do this well in the future, in this case, the San Diego Convention Center would need some upgrades to be able to replicate the ESRI UC 2020 virtual experience. And people organizing conferences like ESRI and us and other people would need to think carefully about what things are in person only and what things are available both virtually as well as uh, in person and probably simultaneously. So that's the backdrop for what I'm going to say about teaching. So teaching uh, pre-COVID. Uh, so in person, uh, we had dedicated classrooms and laboratories. Uh, the top picture on the right there is the GIS lab at uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, for example. Uh, typically, universities charge tuition, uh, among other things, to cover the cost of faculty and staff. And many of our universities are also set up to provide food, to provide housing, to ensure public safety, to provide transportation and so forth. But our campus, we call these auxiliaries. And our inability to provide auxiliaries to students that are not here that has been a large part of our problems in terms of our budget and so forth. In the online world, we may or may not uh, up to now have needed classrooms. Uh, we still charge tuition to cover the cost of faculty and staff, uh, but experience has taught us that we need other support. Uh, in many cases, we need instructional design. We need technology. Uh, the, the picture at the bottom is the interface to the University of Maryland's virtual GIS lab. All of us probably for the last eight months have been standing up something like this. And so that needs, in our case, at least virtual desktops and servers. And, uh, and in many online programs, you need uh, a, a separate staff to help with recruitment and instructional support. And in and, and many universities, these were run as separate operations until now. And what's sort of buried in the middle of this, at least as I think about uh, what we do at USC is that sometimes we're aiming to be in person, other times we're aiming to be online. Uh, sometimes we're aiming to to have the teaching experience be synchronous, and other times we're quite happy for it to be asynchronous. And uh, in some cases, people conflate these terms so that in person is synchronous and online is asynchronous. 
Uh, but I think COVID-19 taught us that that does not have to be the case. So what does, what does teaching look like post COVID-19? Well, it, it relies heavily on internet connectivity. Uh, I'm sitting in my office this morning because I've learned that if I want to guarantee my connectivity to a session like this, it's not generally a good idea to sit in my house. Uh, we need video conferencing software. Uh, in this case, we're using WebEx, but typically uh, I'm much more familiar with Zoom, but all of these uh, video conferencing software have capabilities for recordings, for breakout rooms, uh, and so on. And typically, uh, we need learning management systems, so there are many of these too, Blackboard, Canvas. Uh, but again, uh, we've typically thought of these as either in-person and synchronous or online and asynchronous, at least that's how I've thought about them. And, and I don't think we have to think about them in those ways anymore because we might be able to do all four of these things simultaneously. So let me tell you then just briefly, uh, at USC we have four master's programs. We have one in spatial data science, a second in spatial economics and data analysis, and currently, uh, those two programs are in person. And then we have, for the longest time, uh, an online program in geographic information science and technology, and a more recent one in human security and geospatial intelligence. And in order to support these programs the last four or five years, we've basically uh, stood up uh, separate sections uh, in the two modalities. So if we're going to use, say, a gateway class concepts for spatial thinking, uh, when we're using it in the in-person programs, then we have a section that we teach live uh, in person. And then if we're doing the same in our online programs, we have a section uh, that's not live. It's asynchronous. Uh, and largely the, the, the exchange and the contact works through uh, videos, video presentations, office hours, and a set of materials we share and assignments that the students provide back to us and about which we provide feedback and so forth. And uh, in our case, it, it, in the Spatial Sciences Institute at USC, one unit administers both these in-person programs as well as the online programs. So they're all part of our enterprise, but I would note in many other universities across the world, uh, these operations, meaning online programs and in-person programs, are uh, spread across separate academic units. And in some cases, in a branch of the university that was set up some time ago uh, with this idea that we were going to specialise in online, and that that was somehow a different enterprise than teaching on campus uh, in person. So my last slide is to, is to wonder what the future might look like. Uh, and I, I have sort of two guiding observations that, that, have, that have been very persuasive in me thinking about this topic. The first is, uh, we, we've been teaching our online Masters of Science in Geographic Information Science and Technology for a little more than 10 years. I think so far we've graduated about somewhere between 300 and 350 students. And using government data in the United States, I think we are the largest program in terms of number of graduates. And, th and that's been very successful, but I've, I've long been aware that uh, when students report back about job interviews and things like that, they, they often find a, an audience in their job interview that's skeptical about the value of online education. Online has often been thought as a notch below, I think, uh, in person. And, you know, I think what the last nine months may have, have shown us all is that uh, online teaching may, may be more attractive moving forward. And as a consequence, uh, uh, choosing online as the modality for one's education might be more attractive as well. And, and the second, I think, is that I believe uh, – I think students are going to likely want more flexibility moving forward. And so it's not the case that you're going to have an opportunity to say, well, you either take the online or you take the residential degree. Maybe the student wants to be online on Tuesdays and Thursdays and asynchronous, and on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, they want to be in-person and synchronous. 
or maybe they want to do a week about, or maybe a semester about, or they want to do one class in person and synchronous and the other class uh, uh, online and asynchronous. And so what, what, what we've been thinking about in terms of the programs that I operate here is that our engineering school has, has basically built from the ground up over a number of years what they call their distance education network. And that entails that, that all of this in person, online, synchronous and asynchronous all happens together. Uh, in the sense that you have specially equipped classrooms that enable you to show slides, to draw on a whiteboard, uh, to sketch problems, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but more importantly, it's, it's not a room that an instructor by themselves walks into, because as you see at the, at the picture at the top there, there's a control room with dedicated professionals who, uh, whose job it is to help the faculty and teaching assistants to optimize uh, the experience, the performance uh, when, when they're using these classrooms. And, and to my way of thinking, this means that uh, the, 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 the benefactor is the student because they could choose to be in person or they could choose to be remote. Remote would be better, a better word than online here. Uh, they could they could choose to be either in person or remote and synchronous, uh, but because all of these materials and these experiences are being recorded, they could also then choose to be uh, uh, a remote and asynchronous, uh, and and they could switch that up with any kind of granularity they wanted, and that the burden then for us as educators and instructional designers and so forth is to be able to build. Uh, meaningful and roughly equivalent experiences and interactions for the students and us uh, when they choose synchronous versus asynchronous or in-person versus remote uh, as we go forward. And so I, I think the world is full of new opportunities and uh, it'll take us some time to work out uh, how to equip ourselves and, and, and how to acquire uh, the the knowledge and experience to be able to, to leverage those appropriately. And so that I'll stop and uh, I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you.